I can fix your face. Wow, that is surprisingly mean. You have a stress crease down the center of your forehead here. Oh, you know, I'm actually not very good at people touching my face. I'm studying to be an acupressurist. Oh. I'm Summer. Josh, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Oh, no thanks. I just read that coffee has mycotoxins that can kill you. But if you want, I'll sit and watch you slowly die. I'd like that. <laughs> You must be the new celebrity lawyer in town. I guess. How's the case going? You think he did it? Between you and me, he's kind of a kook. You know, this is my first murder case, so as long as I just get it to trial, then it's good for my career. Anyway, how about you? What brings you down here? I'm in town to help my dad. He's accused of killing his wife. But his lawyers never tried a murder case before. And between you and me, he thinks my dad's kind of a kook. You look I, fantastic. How am I doing? Am I sitting okay? You're doing okay. great. <laughs> uh, and um, while we're all taking you in, can we talk about these shoes? Oh, yeah. These purple heels are gorgeous. And they have gorgeous. Like, a reflection yeah. on the back. They're yeah, they're fancy. amazing. Do you know who makes them? Do you, you know, we're who all going to know. Who are you wearing? Sebastian. Oh, well, I'm going to mm -hmm. go get a pair of those. Okay, good. <laughs> Let's talk about trial and error. Yes. This show, which I have had the privilege of getting a sneak peek of, is yeah. so funny. Thank you. It's, We're really happy with it. We think we had a great time making it. So if, if people are having a third of the time <laughs> of fun watching it that we did, then we did all right. So it debuts on March 14th, March which 14th. is this coming Tuesday. Yes. Two episodes. Yes. Right on the heels of This Is Us. This Is Us, the finale of This Is Us. So we know you're watching that, so just don't turn your TV off. And you got it. Um, yeah, so it's a, we're going to air every uh, week. We'll have two episodes back to back. So the whole thing is kind of like a television event and um, it's sort of trying to simulate a bingeable uh, experience a la Making a Murderer, where we all sat in our living room and didn't leave. That's what we're trying to um, to make. Well, and this is very much on the heels of Making a Murderer. It's basically yeah. a satire of that true crime drama. Exactly. Uh, but in the style of The Office or 30 Rock. Right. And it's shot in the same way, too. Yeah, in the documentary style. So it's like watching a small town go through this murder that sends shockwaves through this, you know, sleepy town. And, um, and the fact that really nobody in the town has ever had to deal with any of these things and is not equipped with it. So they're all really terrible at their jobs and unfortunately it's literal life and death circumstances and um, it, it adds you know stakes is what make, makes things funny mm -hmm. stakes is what make comedy so it's life or death it doesn't get funnier than that <laughs> did you um, actually like watch all of making a murderer and the jinx and oh, yeah. other like the OJ true crime oh and on stuff? serial I was like obsessed with all of it yeah 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 the Amanda Knox story like all over it so um, and I also loved 30 Rock in the office and Parks mm -hmm. and Rec and all of that. So when um, when I saw the project, I was like, oh, well, this is definitely definitely what I want to be involved in. So, what an incredible ensemble. Yeah. I mean, you don't get any better than John Lithgow. and He was the, here. Yeah, he recently. was here. Yeah. And he actually said on this very stage that he hadn't had a feeling about a script this uh, exciting, sort of like this viscerally um, right since Third Rock from the Sun. Totally, yeah. And I can tell that watching the show. Yeah, I mean, he, I was the last member to join the cast, so this whole group had already been set up, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was so intimidating and, and exciting and nerve-wracking, and I just thought, I read it and thought, this is it, like, I'm going to just stay home all night and work on this and hope to get it. Yeah. And when, when something that you want so badly actually happens it's like it, it never happens like that for an actor it's always the like you get something and then you're then you're like well I'm glad I didn't get that I'm mm -hmm. glad it actually worked out for the best I didn't you're always telling yourself that like it's okay it worked out better but then you actually get the thing you want and you're like this is so much better <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what was the audition process like for this did you just go into a like a big call how many callbacks did you have who it did was, you read with it was embarrassingly easy they had had a hard time finding the role 
And um, a casting, I was in LA, a casting director in New York said, how about Krista? They called me in, I read in front of the um, producer and writer, Jeff Astrov, and I had the job the next day. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it's embarrassing. I, it's like, oh, acting it is easy. It never happens like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, fortunately I had worked with some of the people, I had mm-hmm. worked on the network before with Smash, and, um, you know, sometimes work turns into more work and mm-hmm. that's what happened. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Smash yes. because that, like this sort of in a different kind of way, was a mashup of genres. This yes. is crime and comedy and that was music and drama. Right. Um, I, of course, loved that show yes. and um, I got to actually see you perform it, some of it live in the concert version of Hit, of List, Hit List, which you did. Yeah. Can you take us back to Smash and playing Anna Vargas and sort of recreating your real world on Broadway on a screen. Yeah, I mean, I had done some TV stuff here and there and I'd done some pilots that never went anywhere and some guest stars. And so when Smash sort of came around, it was like, oh God, I don't know how to do this. And then the second thought was, I actually know exactly how to do mm-hmm. this. <laughs> I've been doing Broadway for 10 years. Like, I just need to do this. So, um, so that was a nice uh, sort of transition into that. And... Um, and it was so fun. You know, we were joining in the second season as new characters, me and Jeremy Jordan and Andy Mantis. Mm-hmm. And um, to kind of be uh, a new group of people that we were creating something new together. And then we became really close. And it was just so much fun. You're just making a musical every week with your friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when you brought it back, did you take part in the concert version of Bombshell? No. Andy and I were in L.A. doing the Spring Awakening, Deaf West, um, out of town tryout, if as it turned out to be. Yeah. Um, and so we couldn't fly in for the thing, but we were all set to do it. But then we couldn't do it, so we missed out on that. But um, it always seems like Bombshell is performing in like a Broadway stage, and Hitless is performing in the basement, which is <laughs> exactly what it should be. You know, we're yeah. not, Hitless was already the scrappy show that could. You know, and we're always like we're doing something in the basement of Fifty Four. <laughs> oh, and it was so good. And luckily, they let. Andy come back for it, even though his even though, character yes. had a... Uh, Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, well, I think if anybody hasn't caught up on the second <laughs> season of Smash, then they... are really they, behind, yeah, guys. Yeah, get on it. <laughs> um, and, okay, so let's talk about Spring Awakening, because yeah. you and I first crossed paths when you were in the original Spring Awakening, yes. and I was a Spring Awakening super fan. Super fan, as as many... As, as was Andy Mantis, actually. Was he really? Yes. Oh, my gosh, that's so funny. And I was, too. Before I joined the Broadway, I'd seen it off-Broadway, and uh-huh. I was obsessed with it. And I called my mom. I said, I'm going to be in this show. And she's like, okay. And I'm like, no, seriously, listen I'm to me. Gonna I'm going to be in this show. So I was a super fan. Everyone was a super fan, so... And your role, you were a swing, so you yeah. played a lot of different characters. I went back so many times to see that show that I saw you play Anna. I saw you play Ilsa. I missed you playing Vendla, and I will there never forgive myself. There was only four times. It was no. very quick, but yeah. But most of the time, you were sitting on the stage um, amongst the audience, sort of disguised as an audience member. So you and I ended up sitting next to each other yes. several times yeah. for that show. It's like my microphone. Like I'm pulling it out. We oh, pulled that's microphones right. out of our shirts. And people would be like, why are yeah. these audience members singing along? Like, you're next. I know. Well, I knew the choreography. I yeah. went back so many times. Uh, so you uh, have said several times that Ilsa is one of your favorite characters you played, not just as a swing in Spring Awakening, but across your Ever. lengthy career, seven Broadway shows, mm-hmm. and two of them are Spring Awakening. Yes, This call to be in the Deaf West version came at a very specific moment in history that if it had been slightly off, you wouldn't have been able to take it. Exactly. Yeah. I had Andy, um, again, Andy Mantis, responsible for my career, um, (laughs) apparently, um, um, called me because him and uh, his partner, Michael, were working on this Deaf West production, which was going to incorporate sign language and hearing actors and all of that. And he had told me about it, and I thought it was such a brilliant idea. At this point, I'm twice the age of Ilsa, so it doesn't ever cross my mind to be in it. And then um, when they moved the production to Beverly Hills, they he called me and said, "What is your um, what's your schedule like now?" In the meantime, I was going through treatment for breast cancer, so I was finishing chemo, and I had six weeks between the end of chemo and the, the my double mastectomy. And it happened to me the first rehearsal was the day after chemo, and the last performance was the day before my surgery. And so he's like, any chance you want to come play Ilsa? And I was like, yes. I just shouted yes, because I would figure it out, whatever it was. And it was amazing. It was such an incredible experience. And I, I, perf- I was completely bald. I performed the show bald. Um, 
it added such a different layer to the character sort of, you know, in the first version, she was sort of hiding her brokenness. And in this way, she can kind of not hide her break- mm-hmm. brokenness as much. So it was really, um, it was really powerful for me. And it kind of helped me through a really difficult time. And then I'm recovering from surgery and they call and say, do you want to go to Broadway? And, and so here we were going to Broadway and I'm getting to play Ilsa when, you know, it's like if someone came up to me now and was like, do you want to play Annie? And you're like, that's never happening, you know? So to say like, do you want to play Ilsa? And do you want to do it in one of the most difficult periods of your life and do you want to learn sign language and do you want to like be in another Tony nominated revival of the show that you've loved (laughs) your whole life you know like it was just like yes 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 so wow there's so much in there there's a lot (laughs) I spent the morning rereading your blogs from kristacouture.com which Mm -hmm. was your it sort of started as a fashion blog but became sort of a a cancer journey yes Um, and there's so much empowerment in there in addition to the gorgeous photos Thank you. Um, My boyfriend takes those pictures. Well, Peter Westervelt. Props to him. Uh-huh. Um, and the way that you decided to take the worst thing that ever happened to you and make it into something truly beautiful f- for everyone observing it, and I hope for you as well, is really inspiring. I mean, cancer has touched so many people's lives. Right. Yeah. And um, myself included, and reading through it, it was useful and therapeutic for me. Um, so I'm glad that's still there. I'm glad you've left it up. Yeah, I left it up. Um, in fact, <laughs> it was hacked recently, so I just got it really? back up. Yeah, so it's back on on board. So Christopher Who hacks Dorgat, a Tom, cancer I know, I know. <laughs> People are crazy, um, but anyway, I. Um, Uh, Yeah, I I kind of started it as a fashion blog, like you said, and thought, you know, this might be a fun way to just, like, let the people in my life know what's going on. You know, it sort of was going to be a smaller reach. And then um, and then I realized that, you know, I had already been dealing with it for five months by the time I launched the blog and that people were really playing catch up as to what was happening with me. Mm -hmm. I'm already through chemo and going all this stuff. And so they um, so I started maybe talking about the story more to try to tell everybody what was happening. So it became more narrative about my journey. And then um, and then what really surprised me the most was that it, it reached beyond what I expected and spoke to a lot of women who were going through it and mm-hmm. they in turn gave me so much hope and strength and um, advice and all and sisterhood and it was a really special thing and I'm so glad I did it and it's it's scary to especially if you're an actor there's a lot of like oh my privacy and my personal life that you want to keep sort of on guard but then all of a sudden Everybody knows everything about you, about you know, very private things, and it can sometimes just feel cathartic. And um, and my goal was always wherever I can be useful, I want to do it. So if I feel like it can help somebody, I'm going to talk about whatever I need to. I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let's go back to your childhood. You mentioned Annie a second yes. ago. That was the first pro- professional production you saw at age I saw, five, right? I never played Annie. So oh, if anybody out there needs... <laughs> I wonder if you still have time <laughs> left on that one. middle-aged Annie. <laughs> and maybe, a, maybe another sequel is in the works. Yeah, There exactly. was an Annie, too, I think. Yeah, there was. Briefly. Yes. <laughs> I was in Annie Warbucks as a child, but I did not play Annie. Um, anyway, so yes, that was the first show that I saw when I was five. And yeah. then you went on to be a dancer, a cheerleader. I did some very deep YouTubing uh-huh. just last week. Yes. Um, can we talk about Colby's Clubhouse? Yes. Yes. Get, for people who don't know about it, give a little background on what this is. Well, it was like a, ch- a children's television show a la Barney, but it was with a dancing computer who, um, I don't really know. I actually don't remember why he was a computer. I feel like there was a reason, but I can't remember. Uh, computers were very big in the, or in the, in the mid-90s. I in more ways than one. Like yeah. They were, he was a huge he was, computer. <laughs> he was like a walking dancing computer, and we sang and danced and um, taught Bible stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I just that's... watched an episode mm-hmm. where your big sister was in trouble because she was taking drugs. Was she doing drugs? drugs? Nah. Yeah. And yeah. you just consulted no. your friends and sang and some computer. songs about it and uh-huh. danced about it. And um, you ended up <laughs> we making sang up. and sang and danced about it. Mm-hmm. We worked out our feelings through song. And uh, yeah, yeah, that was like a, just a fun thing that I did when I was young. And I can't believe it's still around. All of a sudden, YouTube intersected with, you know, videos from your past. And all of a sudden, something you did when you were 12 is now all over the internet. There are hundreds of episodes of yeah. this show. Yeah. Um, and I had fun watching you know, yeah. watching some of those. Uh, was that your first professional gig? 
um, or television yeah. gig? Yeah. Well, at, well, if we're getting technical, my first professional gig was for Cataract Eye Center uh, when I was <laughs> like, I, I don't know, three years old. I really? played like a granddaughter in a cataract surgery commercial. Yeah. So that was my first professional gig. Okay, um, so it wasn't. Annie I don't know why that, that's not on YouTube, but uh, <laughs> somebody is going to find it. Somebody go out and find that. My mom has it. She can put it up. Uh, you were, you've done some other commercials recently. That did you do a cereal commercial? Um, I no. feel like or Wells. That you know what wait, that cereal commercial might have been Aubrey Plaza because Aubrey Plaza was in a commercial recently and everyone thought it was me, but it was not me. I. <laughs> So you've done no commercials. I've done as an commercials, adult? but not in the last like f- three or four years. Oh I did a Pizza I Hut. Swear there was one. I well, did a Borsong cheese. I believe that you know your mm-hmm. resume better than I do. Maybe so not, I'm not though. going it's, to insist. Is, <laughs> you find it, I'll let you know. But literally, people were calling me like, "I'm seeing your spot." I'm like, "That's Aubrey." <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Huh. So maybe it was. All right. So was you moved to New York? Was it for school or for was school. it for work? Yes. And so you were going to school right around here at, at NYU. NYU. Mm-hmm. And Spring Awakening happened simultaneously. No, with that? no. Good Vibrations. That's my right. First music, my first Broadway show was Good Vibrations, which was a Beach Boys jukebox musical. Mm-hmm. And well, technically, my first professional job in New York was um, I did Bye Bye Birdie at Encores, right. which was really fun, and I got to like miss the last two weeks of school, and um, and so I did that, and then I got the Good Vibrations out of town tryout and then it's turned into a Broadway show and so I took a leave of absence from NYU and then I did a tour and I kept extending the leave of absence I went back to finish and I got spring awakening like in the middle of the year and they were like just leave just please don't come back (laughs) and also there were a lot of people from NYU that were in the original spring awakening so when I came in I was like I got a job they're like is it spring awakening (laughs) they're like all of you it's taking all of you and they're like just go so I never finished school but um I don't think my degree in musical theater is going to help me at this point anyway so yeah it's ha- not having it is certainly not holding yes. you back yeah uh, I just listened to the original Spring Awakening cast album yeah to just kind of get myself in the mood for it and I realized that Ilsa's two big through lines both involve the word summer yeah you've got oh my god in in blue wind you've got you know spring and summer mm-hmm. and then the song of purple, purple summer. summer you had a couple of quotes from that song on your blog also the dark i know well about like a dad who's not great oh yeah that's right <laughs> That's right. And so, you know, I have like a potentially murderous father in this. Oh my gosh. There's so many connections. So many connections. It was such foreshadowing. We didn't even know. Uh, (laughs) I'm so excited for people to get to see Trial and Error because having seen several episodes now before the show has officially launched, I just want to talk to people about it. Yeah, it's really fun. And and the murder mystery is so, it keeps you on the edge of your seat too. It does. It takes some twists and turns. and, um, And we didn't know, no one told us if he was guilty or innocent. He was the only one that knew. And we didn't know anything about the twists in terms of the case. So we would get the scripts and normally when you're like, what am I saying? How many lines do I have? Mm-hmm. You're like, skip, 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 skip. What's happening? What do they say? You know, it's like, got to find out, you know, what evidence piles up against him this time or, you know, something. So it's really fun. It's will really we adventure. find out by the end of season you will. one you whether will. or not he's the murderer? Yes. All right. So yes. then what happens in season? Like The goal has always two. been to sort of... Uh, American Horror Story this and do a new uh, case every year. That's what the producers have said. Same town, same law team, Uh new uh, potential uh, criminal. I hope that each criminal or the law team continues to need an acupressurist. E- yes. <laughs> so Summer can come yeah, in and be yeah. part of Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, I figure out a way to make myself invaluable oh, to the case. Good. good. I can't wait so. to find that out. So I have this theory. Um, murder is obviously a difficult thing to laugh about. Sure. It's like an unlikely concept for a comedy. But Sherry Shepard's character has all these crazy ailments. Yeah. She has facial blindness. She faints when she sees beautiful things. But she also laughs and uncomfortable situations. Yes. And laughter is contagious. And I feel like that was such a smart addition to her battery of neuroses because when she starts laughing at something murder related... Her laughter is... I mean, if laughter is contagious, she is the most dangerous virus we have. (laughs) Like, her laugh is so funny. And you can't... And she can go on. She can go on for 
10 minutes. She, they actually have to call cut because she's just, she can keep going and laugh and laugh and laugh. And I'm cry, I'm like cry laughing watching it. She's so funny. Everyone on the show. And you know, Jama playing such a sweet character on Glee, like a really innocent, is like a really like tough as nails DA, like gonna do anything kind of like really inappropriate and a little nasty every <laughs> once in a while. Like I'm just excited for everyone to see sort of the different sides of these people. And I think people will be pleasantly surprised. I want to give a little tease without giving anything away that in addition to Summer, you make a cameo as another character. I do. Who, um, in a flashback. Yeah. Uh, and in that flashback, John Lithgow is wearing this ridiculous hippie wig. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so am I. Uh, yeah, a very well, yeah, long hippie you've wig. You've got, you've got a, a, yours is more like you look Gorgeous, I look like, beautiful. Like he looks ridiculous. Show yeah, exactly. Um, and I was looking to see if I could sense you guys about to break in that scene. Didn't look yeah. like you did, but I can't imagine it was easy to keep a straight we face. Did, we never kept a straight face in this entire show. We just laughed our way through the whole thing. So it was it was a joy to go to table reads and make everybody laugh. You know, sometimes it can be you know, are they going to laugh or are they? How is the script turn out? But like everyone was welcoming and exciting, and everyone was really looking forward to it. So I hope um, everyone really likes it because we'd like to keep doing it. Uh, I think it's not a question of <laughs> if, it's a question of when. And actually yeah. we know the answer to that too. Tuesday, Tuesday the 14th, <laughs> right after This Is Us. Yes. How do you feel about taking a couple of questions from I the would audience? Love it. Let's yes. do it. Hey, Krista. Uh, Hi. I've been a fan of your work uh, in theater. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, we had John Lico not that long ago. Uh -huh. I was wondering what was it like getting to work with him, uh, having such a time to act around this show it's amazing he's so um he's so nimble that's the way i can describe him he can just change on a dime and be hilarious and then be heartbreaking and then be kind of creepy he just it, with with ease and so it's it was really a great lesson watching him he just seems to have no fear diving into these things and um Certainly no fear of looking silly or any kind of self-consciousness. He just dives right in. And um, I was, like, nervous to to work with him a little bit. I only heard amazing, beautiful things about him. And so we were there for rehearsal, and I did my scene, that first scene with Nick that you saw. And he happened to be sitting there because we were about to do another one. And afterwards, he, he like, gave me a thumbs up. And, like, the shoulders went down. And I was like, okay, I can relax now, like... Dad's here. Dad's got me. We're we're gonna be great. And I've been really lucky. You know, I played Nathan Lane's daughter as well. And yeah. Oh yeah. We just, didn't even get into he's Adam's a legend. family. So um, you know, I've been really lucky to have like great dads and um, who have been really nurturing and so talented. And um, I I aspire to be even close to how kind and um, talented they both are. But yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Do we have another question? Yes. Hello. Hi. I just wanted to know what television or movie would you like to see go on Broadway? Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, oh, man, you have me on the spot. Let me think. Um, oh, duh. I have this answer. I want to play Faye in the That Thing You Do musical, <sighs> like nobody's business. I grew up watching that movie. Um, it was filmed in my town that really? I grew up in. Yes. And it's so fun. And it's like, you know, a perfect musical. There's just music throughout the whole thing. And Liv Tyler plays sort of the girlfriend of the lead guy, like the lead singer. Um, and she sort of gets left behind and then finds her own voice. Um, but I, I think it's a perfect transfer, and I've been talking about this for a while. So that thing you do. Somebody call Tom Hanks. Somebody call Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is on Broadway. Yeah, and he produ produces things. Yeah, he can do it. He yeah, wrote the songs. That actually makes me think. I'm looking at these folks. Yeah, and I know at least. Well, more than half of these folks can definitely sing. Yes. Will you be doing a musical episode of Trial and Error? Now, we have n we could try. We have not had any music in Trial and Error. I kept waiting for the inevitable karaoke scene or something like uh -huh. that where, uh, where they use the chops. But um, instead, we would sing on stage, like, between takes all the time. Mm -hmm. We would have, like, goofy numbers that we would make up, and we'd break out into six-part harmony, all of us. Whoa. Yeah, just, like, out of nowhere. Did anyone get that on their iPhone video? Sometimes we have some things on the video. Yeah, sometimes they couldn't get it out fast enough, but we, we would have a song where... Um, 
you know, it takes a while, especially with this format, the cameras are um, catching everything. And so you're kind of playing it out like a, like a theater piece, mm -hmm. much more than you would w doing one side of the coverage, the other side of the coverage, which is what you would normally do on TV. And so, um, so we would kind of work it out like theater. So it would take a while for it to click sometimes. And when you would feel that first take where it would click, um, Nick to go, so it would turn and say, that felt, and then we all go, pretty much like a scene, pretty much like a scene. And we had this like pretty much like a scene song that we would do all the time. And we'd have harmonies, we'd do choreography, we'd play spoons, we'd like make it a jazz piece, we'd make it a hoedown. <laughs> we'd like, it, that was like the moral booster of like, we got, we, we got this scene, now we're gonna really play it out, you know, with gusto. So we would do that, we had, our rap, both our rap parties from the pilot and the series, we did karaoke, and Sherry does a mean, proud Mary, let me tell you. And um, uh, Stephen and I sang Suddenly Seymour. Uh. So we're a very musical-centric uh, uh, crew, crew, and I couldn't be more grateful for the people who are willing to look really stupid with me. <laughs> well, season two, I'm hoping, I'm putting, out, I'm putting it out into the universe now. I want a musical episode. Musical episode. Trial and error. Yeah. Uh, do we have another question? Hey, Krista. Yeah. Thank Hi. you for being here. Uh, who would you love to see guest star in a future episode? Ooh. Um, shoot for the stars. I could shoot for the stars. Um, Helen Mirren. <laughs> that would I be awesome. I want to see what shenanigans, like, really uh, refined Helen Mirren will get in at East Peck, South Carolina. Um, you know a little bit more of the world of the town. It's... A little I've out there. I know it, yeah. yeah. I mean, we do, we all know, just from this photograph, yeah. that the law office shares its space with a taxidermy, with a taxidermy office. office. And I think mm -hmm. that's a pretty good indicator of yeah. the kind of town we're talking about. Yes. How small town. You know, you could also see if you could get Tom Hanks to guest star. Tom and Hanks. And then you can plug in and your idea. And then we'll do, yeah, the East Peck, the town of East Peck, much like... Um, what uh, what they did on Gilmore Girls is putting on a musical yeah. of that thing you do. And, and then Tom it can Hanks transfer to Broadway. It. Perfect. I love it. You heard it here, folks. Well, Krista, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know. But sad. I'm so happy that you came to see us. I'm thrilled that you're going to be in households across America because yeah. we kind of hogged you in New York <laughs> with all this theater you've been doing. Yes. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to do this and come back and grace us on the New York stage sometime soon. I would love it. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. And thanks. Thanks. <laughs>